Hello, this is Debbie Kay with the League of Women Voters of Portland, and you're watching Video Voters Guide. We're here today with Metro East Community Media's support to talk with candidates running in the May 2020 primary election. With me today is Saren Bussell. She is running for State Representative, District 33. Welcome, Saren. Thank you very much for having me. Glad you could come. Let's get started. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for this office. Great, thank you. So again, my name is Saren Bussell. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm a geologist and dog mom and union member, and I'm formerly chief of staff to state Senator Jeff Golden. And I'm running because I grew up in North Carolina where there was very overt uh, racism going on and long story short, moved to Portland, Oregon a number of years ago and then was shocked and alarmed to see such systemic racism happening in Oregon. And again, long story short, worked in 2019 in the Oregon legislature and watched pretty much on a daily basis as continue it as they continued to not put racial justice and social justice and economic justice first every day. And I, when this seat opened up, I knew that I wanted to vote for someone who was going to put racial justice, social justice, economic justice first. And so I felt like I had to step up and run because that's the type of person I wanted to vote for. So here I am. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we're living through a pandemic. And what do you think the challenges have been and what challenges will be created um, that affect the efficient administration of Oregon state government? And how do you propose to meet those challenges of effective and efficient government? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So certainly we're seeing our public health systems be taxed. We're seeing our education system struggling. And I, you, there's, <laughs> So many safety nets that really aren't in place for folks from farm workers, day laborers, immigrants, and, and undocumented folks who are taxpayers to teachers and first responders and service workers of all stripes who really don't have those safety nets in place. And I honestly see a lot of this rolling up to the highest level of revenue reform. And I think many of our systems, including education, public health, healthcare, transportation, all of it needs to be fully funded. And I think we need to look at our revenue systems for not having those safety nets in place because we haven't funded them fully and effectively. And so I think that's why we're seeing really such a huge crisis for folks and not being able to get them unemployment benefits in a timely fashion because our unemployment system was not built for these types of spikes. It was built for more of a trickle and more of a, a continuous steady flow as opposed to this huge spike in unemployment that we're seeing. And again, if we had those safety nets in place and fully funded, I think we'd be more equipped and more nimble to address them right now. Thank you. Moving on to redistricting. Traditionally, the legislature has conducted the, de the decennial redistricting process, and we're coming up on that next year in 2021. Are you comfortable with the current redistricting process? And if not, how would you like to change it? Yeah, I think that's a great question. So in my mind, I think we need to look at outcomes and what's the outcome we envision. Personally, when I close my, my eyes in my mind's eye, I envision an Oregon that is represented by folks who reflect the shared lived experiences of the people in the districts and areas that they represent from, um, from different racial backgrounds, from cultural backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, education, income, lived, various lived experiences, folks from the LGBTQ community, folks, um, people with disabilities, and, and on and on. And I think it's critically important that people in office reflect that shared lived experience with folks they represent. And so having that as an outcome, whether that's people on school boards, at city councils, at the state level, I think in my mind, redistricting needs to keep that in mind as an outcome. And therefore the folks who are on, let's say it's a panel of people, however that panel might be chosen, it also needs to be reflective of the diversity in Oregon. Because to me, it's a difference between 
um, a fair approach, an equal approach versus an equitable approach. And if we're going to do something extremely objective and 100% fair, look, you know, using that word, we could easily put all the voters in a computer algorithm and have GIS, a, a geographic information system, carve up districts by an equal number of people, maybe a, a particular age range and party affiliation, and no person ever has to touch it. But is that the outcome we want? Is that the most equitable way of representing folks in Oregon? And I don't think it is. And so with, the, with an equitable outcome in mind, I think we need to work backwards from there. And, and then that will determine who is on a panel or how we decide, or how we're going to decide how to redistrict. So again, it's, it's about outcomes for me and, and where to start there. Thank you. What are your thoughts on cap and trade proposals intended to mitigate climate change? Are they a good idea and why or why not? Another great question. So as a geologist and also as the board chair of the Crag Law Center, which is an environmental legal nonprofit that has done things like keeping Nestle from bottling public water in the gorge. They're also fighting against the Jordan Cove liquefied natural gas plant in Coos Bay. They've fought a youth climate case all the way up to the Oregon Supreme Court. So climate change is, to me, the most pressing existential threat of our time. And so we do need to work on it and address it. And I think some of the things we need to work on is getting cars off the road, so becoming less dependent on fossil fuels. I think we need an Oregon Green New Deal, and that means making sure that there's a just transition for workers so that if it, when and if folks are transitioned out of, say, a fossil fuel-based economy and into a renewable, sustainable energy economy, it means that they get training and paid for, their education gets paid for, and no one should have to uproot their entire lives to get retrained and, and work, become uh, transition into a new field in order to work on sustainable energy jobs. Um, again, and so then that means investing in projects like public transportation, high-speed rail across the state, um, and that means taxing polluters and taxing fossil fuel companies so that they can't continue to perpetuate harm against um, and we are seeing a lot of harm already around the world and in Oregon, particularly with immigrant communities, low income communities, communities of color. They're seeing adverse health outcomes. They're, they are literally being, their air is worse, there's worse air along freeways. And with that said, again, in my mind, we always need to be asking for every piece of legislation who is impacted. Are there, and are there equitable outcomes and who's benefiting from these policies? And that means that if we're going to address climate change with something like an Oregon Green New Deal, with something like investing in public transit, folks who are impacted have to be at the table making the decisions that affect them. Because then in the end, again, it's about outcomes. We have to make sure that folks who are being adversely affected now don't continue to be adversely affected later. And in fact, they benefit and we all benefit in the end as well, but they have to be at the table making those decisions. People who are frontline communities, impacted communities have to be there. So yes, I think we need to address climate change. And again, it's the how we address it and with whom. Thank you, that was a, a comprehensive answer. <laughs> uh, can you answer super fast the question what is your view of the suggestion that the legislature suspend collecting taxes that will fund the 2019 Student Success Act? Yes, I think, I think the answer is yes. And unfortunately, that is because we've seen austerity budgeting over time. And if we had just been increasing taxes appropriately over the last 30 or 40 years, we wouldn't be in this tough situation of having to say yes or no right now. But unfortunately, I think the answer is going to have to be yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and I really appreciate your having such a lot to say in a relatively short period of time. This has been the Video Voter's Guide. Thank you for watching. The primary election is Tuesday, May 19th. Be an informed voter. Please check out www.vote411.org to learn about all the races on your ballot. Thank you for joining us today.